Some Pokemon have hidden messages in their name. A lot of you may know that Ekans is just snake spelled backwards, or Arbok is just Cobra spelled backwards, but only true keen-eyed observers that have opened up their third eye realize what Muck is backwards. Today we'll be taking a look at Muck in a Pokemon Yellow solo run, and some of you might be wondering why yellow today and why not red and blue, and to put it simply, I like to mix in yellow when a Pokemon has potential, but the much harder red and blue early game hold it back, and I think Muck fits that that bill perfectly. This week I'm just going to cut straight to the chase and I'm going to say that if you like solo run content and you just want to help the channel out whether you are someone new, maybe someone who just doesn't normally think about that sort of thing, or if you are a returning subscriber like John Gleeman, likes would really help out the most. And let's see if we can get this video up to 400 of those bad boys and go ahead and comment below on how you think Muck will do in today's video. And without further ado, just sit back, relax, grab yourself a soda pop and let's just kind of dive into it. Let's start out by taking a look at the stats. Muck has an interesting spread here. It's not really the best at anything, but it's not really the worst either. 50 speed is a little worrisome, but you can kind of work around it. And 105 attack looks promising at first glance. It also has a pretty beefy HP stat, and that's gonna let us soak some damage for what's gonna be a pretty slow early game. When we take a look at the first rival, you'll see that we have Pound. It's only marginally better than Tackle. And then you have two 55% accurate moves that don't really have too much use. Disable is a god awful move in Gen 1, and Poison Gas is unreliable at best, and it doesn't really help outside of maybe one situation. But this is just the tutorial battle. There's not much to see here, it's not much of an issue. But let's dive a little bit deeper into the learn set, and you can see why I would choose yellow version today. What we are starting with here is what we're gonna keep all the way up to level 33, and we're only gonna get minimized then. Overall, this is an awful level up learn set, but there are three different bad boosting moves to choose from so that's kind of unique and it always helps to kind of look at the silver lining in all of these runs. As for the TMs, Muck is a pretty limited Pokemon. There's a handful of useful things and that's about it but luckily things like Body Slam, Mega Drain, and Thunderbolt are very good but it would be really nice to have something like Mega Punch to kind of bridge that gap in the early game. As for Viridian Forest, Yellow does do several things to make the early game easier such as put extra trainers here as well as minimize things that can poison you but those things don't really interest me today. You can see here on the first bug catcher how much of a slog it is only having pound. It does take quite a while and with the rock solid Pokemon trainer looming ahead it's clear that we're going to need some extra levels so let's start to go over my battle plan for the early game. The first step was to take on this first bug catcher and then I need to fight one low level wild encounter just for a little baby bit of experience. After that I do take on the one mandatory bug catcher. In the footage here I'm being a little bit greedy I'm refusing to use my potions, but it's just fine. It's a Caterpie. But the main thing to talk about here is that little bit of experience pushed me to level 8, and if you've been watching the channel before, you might know what's going to come next. I spend all of my money, and this week, we're going to get a heaping helping of Light Years Junior Trainer grinding. Now, there's a couple of things to talk about if you aren't familiar with this. The Junior Trainer in Brock's Gym has a Diglett and a Sandshrew. The idea is that you knock out the Diglett, and then you let the Sandshrew take you out. You black out, you rinse, and you repeat. The fact that trainers give 50% extra experience just makes it much more efficient than grinding wild Pokemon. And this method may not be for all solo runners. You might not see it on every channel. They might ban this kind of stuff, but I personally really like this method on my channel. Now the goal here is to do 9 blackouts on the Diglett, and then on the 10th time we're going to beat the trainer, that's going to get us to level 13. And normally I would just skip ahead, but today I want to regale y'all with a story, a little bit of the lore of Gym Leader Matt in the past. And this is honestly one of my fondest memories that I can think of and it involves Muck just to tie it in with today's video. Way back in the ancient days when we used to do link cable battles, the Cinnabar Island glitch where you could duplicate items or catch really high level Pokemon that were glitched to level 255, we were on the playground going against that kind of stuff. Now you couldn't pick which Pokemon you got, there was like two or three, but one kid got a Mewtwo. One of his spawns was a Mewtwo, so he had a level 255 Mewtwo. He was beating everybody but your boy here had a trick up its sleeve. Everybody else was going pure damage. You know how people are when they're younger. If it doesn't do damage, I don't want it. But I was ahead of the curve. I was using a toxic minimized strategy for my muck. 
I had this thing maxed out on stat experience, so it was kind of a beast. I battled this guy, and before I made it to the Mewtwo, I was able to set up six minimizes, and when the Mewtwo came out, I just threw Toxic on it, and I beat him. And I remember he never stopped complaining about it, but for me, I still remember it to this day, when a Poison type beat the strongest Psychic type. And I might be embellishing the memory a little bit, but I'm pretty sure all the kids picked me up on their shoulders and said, Muck, 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 as I was going away. But that's about enough of that story, and I just thought I would share that with you today. Now before I forget, I don't script my videos anymore, so this is going to be a little bit behind. I should have mentioned this earlier. But in yellow version, the Lightyear's Junior Trainer has less levels on his Pokemon, and the key thing is that the Sandshrew does not have Sand Attack, so it makes it overall quicker. Another one of those little things that yellow does to make the early game easier. But we finish up, we hit level 13, and there's not really much else to say other than let's just take a look at the Rock Solid Pokemon Trainer. Geodude is first, and I might sound like a broken record pointing out these differences between yellow and red and blue, but I think it's pretty insightful, and I do feel like there's a stigma that people put on red and blue that it's just so much easier than yellow, and that's just not the case. Brock has two less levels on his Pokemon, and the real main thing about the fight is the Geodude doesn't have defense curl, and that means it's not going to completely wall a Pokemon that only has resisted physical damage. Now here, there's not much strategy. All I can do is go to Pound Town, and it's just going to tackle me and we're just gonna see what happens. And we end up taking it out. It does miss a few tackles. Overall, we're above half health when we go into the Onyx. Now here, we don't outspeed, and this is the one time in the entire run that Poison Gas is gonna be a little bit useful. Brock does have five full heals. If he uses Bide and you get Poison Gas on it, he will not use the full heal till after Bide is up. So it takes a little bit, but eventually he will run out of his 1,000 full heals. He'll get Poison on him, and it's just gonna help out. As long as you don't take heavy Bide damage, you should be all right in this one. Overall, this is pretty consistent. I think I probably tested this about five times, and I think I lost once out of those five times because I was trying to finish it off real quick and I took a lethal bide. But for a Pokemon with only resisted damage and its only move being pound, a 31 minute Brock split, I'll take it. After the battle, I do something that you really don't see too much on the channel. There's very few Pokemon that have to do this. I'm going to be learning the Bide TM today. And this is mainly because I had a I had a little bit of a, I don't want to admit it, but I had a little bit of PP issues in some of my practice runs. While it was really close, I think it's just safe to go ahead and learn it. And I utilize it on the very first Bug Catcher. The idea here is I'm just going to use it on the Caterpie. If it goes for String Shots, it's just going to badge boost me, make my later pounds hit hard. If it goes for straight tackles, it's going to take a ton of damage, so it's kind of a win-win situation. Either way, it's going to save me some pounds later on. Now, I do utilize this on some other battles, like this optional bug catcher that I fight just because I need a little bit of extra experience. I do use it on the Weedle for the same reason, just so I can get the badge boost from getting my speed lowered, and that just makes the Kakuna and Metapod just easier to take out, saves me some PP. Now, I probably overcompensated in this final optimized run. You can see that I have 19 power points left when I finished that battle but like I said in practice I ran out a couple of times and I decided to utilize Bide here so maybe it wasn't needed but I felt like it did help just a little bit. As far as Mount Moon goes I battle some of the usual suspects the super nerd he's pretty much in every video I do I take on the last and then I take on the rocket grunt that replaces the Raticate grunt that's in red and blue I take that out and remember guys we're still rolling with pound here we're going to be using pound until we hit the SSN so it's not great. In the Jesse and James fight, I do get hit with a growl and it's kind of a little bit of a slog. I just can't stress enough how much Mega Punch would make this run. It would change the face of this run, I do believe, because we're basically using Pound forever. Like 25 to 30 percent of this run is straight Pound. And I guess all I can really say is that it's it's kind of a blessing that we do have 105 base attack. At least it, it could be worse, I guess is what I'm trying to say. And all the extra training, the four optional battles, we picked up does allow us to hit level 19 when we're heading towards Cerulean. And when I was planning out this run, I was routing it out and trying to fine tune things. I was wondering if I should make Muck go up to a higher level for rival number two. 33 speed is what the Spearow has and in a perfect world you'd outspeed it but unfortunately at level 20 we'll just speed tie anyway and I just couldn't justify spending even more time in this early game. And the main thing of this fight usually it's sand attack but for today you just kind of hope and 
pray that you don't get growled. And of course, I immediately get growled turn one. And suffice it to say that when you're a Pokemon that only has Pound, getting growled absolutely neuters you and it pretty much renders this fight basically impossible. But I do give it the old college try and I do play it out. As far as the Sandshrew, it's pretty tanky, it's defense is high, but just compound the growl on top of everything, it makes it worse. I can't help but think that it would have already fainted, if not for that, and that means it does get off a sand attack. And when you got sand in your eyes and you're growled, you might as well put a fork in it, but it's pretty much done. I did try to think on my feet here, since Bide bypasses accuracy checks, I thought maybe I could bite a few times and somehow squeak out a victory here, but that's just not the case. And this is a rather early first reset, but Considering what we're working with with Pound, I don't mind it too much. Let's just move on to the next attempt. This time there's no growls for our little Uzi boy today, and a timely crit makes short work of this little bird, and now we're on to the Sand Devil. And at this point, given the circumstances, I've already avoided the growl, I do not care about the Sand Attack. But today, in the second attempt, we do not take one, and you know that once you make it past, if you avoid growl, you avoid Sand Attack, this one is pretty much in my favor, and I close out this battle strong. And I'm not gonna lie to you guys this was one of the battles of the game that I was really worried about just because you're so weak at this stage in the game and believe it or not this is one of the huge hurdles and as for nugget bridge there's not much to talk about we only have pounds so we just kind of do our best there are some little pitfalls you can run into such as Pidgey sand attack or maybe a Nidoran growl or something like that but overall it's pretty simple I keep it to the bare minimum and now I think we should just take a look at Misty As for the star you, I got a one-way ticket to Pound Town, and that's all you really need to know about that one. It's worth noting that in all of my practice runs, I was skipping Misty, getting Body Slam, and coming back because that just kind of makes the most sense, but I gotta give a lot of praise to Bide here. It makes this fight possible because even if you get the worst combinations of moves, let's say you get uh, two bubble beams and a water gun, you have high enough HP to take the damage, and the return on Bide will just one-shot the star me, and that was kind of my goal here today. Now, we do get a little bit unlucky it only goes for two tackles and a water gun but it's still enough damage to to obliterate it almost and get us into a range where one pound can finish it off and overall this one was fairly consistent and i just think it's kind of cool that bide came through to save us a lot of time in this already really slow early game and when you're doing runs that just aren't that strong they don't really have that one hit potential trainers like this junior trainer that has the three pidgeys that all know sand attack can be a problem i don't get knocked out in this run i do get hit with a sand attack it's kind of annoying but I just would like to call out this Pokemon because I've mentioned this trainer a few times but with only pound and some of my practice runs it just kind of derailed the whole thing it's just really annoying and I thought I would point it out down on the SSN finally we get a move body slam everyone that knows anything about generation one knows how strong body slam is but today it's such a massive upgrade it makes muck into a mid Pokemon at best all the way up to a pretty good Pokemon Pokemon. And this is the point in the run where our life really starts to turn around and the run starts to go from below average to something that's going to start to pick up some steam here. You can immediately see the, the night and day difference when we look at rival number two. Body Slam doesn't necessarily one shot everything, but it does heavy enough damage to make this one infinitely smoother than the rival number two fight was. As for Lieutenant Surge, there's not much to say here. I win this battle pretty handily, but I've always thought Lieutenant Surge Surge's anime based team was pretty unique. He doesn't have good AI in yellow and he just has mega punch, mega kick, and thunderbolt. So it's just, it's always just kind of like a roll of the dice with Surge. And I know a lot of people love just the dunk on Surge, especially in red and blue, but I do think the yellow version is interesting and he has cost me a lot of resets out of all the playthroughs I've done of yellow. After the fight, we get the biggest reward of all and it's access to thunderbolt. I do think this is the best coverage move in the entire game. And even though Muck doesn't really learn much for this entire run this is one of the very few things that it does get and I'm pretty grateful for that because it's gonna be really helpful in the run I don't really need to tell you guys that but it's gonna be great and today my friends you know it's probably never good when we have to take a look at rock tunnel now don't panic just yet we just have to take a look at the hiker real quick I have to highlight this because this one was quite the menace in practice now what I end up doing is similar you know how if you're going against a self-destructor you'll use dig go underground it self-destructs then you'll use dig on the next Pokemon bide kind of functions 
animations very similar to that. And here in the footage, you can see this battle start out perfectly. I use Bide, the first Geodude to use self-destruct. The Bide absorbs all that damage. And on the next Geodude, I unleash it all, knock it out. So it's going perfectly planned so far. And then I don't want to use a ton of body slams on the Graveler. So I'm kind of fish out one of these Bides right here. I'm hoping that'll use self-destruct. It never does. It goes for a ton of defense curls. And this one ends up stalling out for a long time. And I'm starting to get really low. And to make matters worse, at the very end, I get it down to a sliver of health. But you can see that it's used so much defense curls that its defense is up to 224 right now. And I try to finish it off with pound just to save some PP. And I end up stalling this battle out even more. I probably honestly should have lost this battle, but I do make it pass. But it was worth showing because I just don't have an answer for rock tops right now at the moment. Or I guess I should specify rock and ground tops. That's a little bit of a problem. So as soon as I get to Celadon, we're going to remedy that. First, I pick up Fly. I'm going a little bit in a different order this week. Normally, you're going to go into the rocket hideout immediately, but we're going to hold off just because of the rock and ground tops. They do inflate your time a little bit. So instead, we're going to go straight to Erica's gym and let's see what she's all about this week. Overall, there's not much to say about Erica. And I've said this once. I'll say it again. I'll say it a million times. From everything that was changed from red and blue version to yellow, Erica was nerfed the most. Her whole entire team is devolved and it's just on a large scale, it's way worse. Whether you like to admit it or not, her Victory Bell is one of the strongest Pokemon in the entirety of Red and Blue, and the only reason it's not as oppressive or talked about as much as it should be is her position in the game. Her gym is located in the game at a point in time where you can just kind of work your way around it. You can fight it as the seventh gym if you really wanted to, so you can just kind of outlevel the content. Now here, we're a poison type. We don't have to worry about anything outside of maybe getting put to sleep, and all that's really going to do is just waste our time, but here it's pretty clean. Just like with Lieutenant Surge, the real prize is the TM after the fight. Mega Drain's really good. we just seen how much of a slog it is to go after rock and ground tops, and there's still quite a few left in the game, and it turns those into easy one-shots rather than having to waste like five, six, seven plus turns just to get through it. So it's a good speed up, and even though Mega Drain is weak, it's there's not much more that Muck gets access to, so we gotta kind of work with what we got. When that's over with, it's time for the rocket hideout. Now, as per usual, I'm gonna be picking up the high money items. And now that we have Mega Drain, we can just kind of take a look at Giovanni number one. And you can, you already know the difference it's gonna make. The Onyx and the Rhyhorn are easy one shots. And the Persian, it's just not very strong. We can take it out with a couple of body slams. Now, the main thing to note is at the end of this fight, I hit level 33, and that's a huge milestone for Muck. This means I get access to Minimize. And if you're not familiar with my new rule set, I will be kind of releasing a video on that soon if you want to like the deep dive on the rules but double team the tm for double team is banned but if a pokemon learns it naturally or something like minimize it's fair game we seen that a while back on a stream with clefairy and this move is going to be the oil for our engine for this run to enable it to be any good at all evasion is kind of a broken stat a lot of times it's a coin flip it can be a little bit frustrating to use but on top of that if you didn't know it also triggers the badge boost glitch and it's really going to enable us to not have to grind in this run. It's going to be really strong. In fact, I might say it's the strongest just general badge boosting move, maybe outside of something like Amnesia, but I just really wanted to emphasize that. And now we can just kind of blow through rival number three real quick. And believe it or not, this is an easy fight. Uh, shocker, I know, rival number four being easy, who would have thought? But I guess it's worth noting that with our current moveset, Muck is almost pretty much at full power outside of learning Mimic late in the game. This is the learn set that we're going to be keeping, and you already know that he doesn't learn pretty much anything else. I did have Fire Blast listed on the side, but that was just something I was kind of testing. It didn't help. Don't learn Fire Blast. We're pretty much at full power. Rival number four is easy. We can skip over the rest of Pokemon Tower. It's pretty trivial. And let's take it all the way down to the Safari Zone. Here, I could definitely use things like the Carbos and the Protein to help our stats out, and I am picking up the Full Restore. Sometimes you'll pick these up just so you don't have to buy them at the end of the game to save some time, but today I will be selling them for some extra cash money and outside of the two final HMs of the run, there's not much more to talk about here. Now it's time for our one Celadon buy. And this one's pretty standard considering we can't really learn anything from those top floor TMs. I do pick up Pokedaw for future Mimic and for the vitamins for this run, we're picking up three proteins and four Carbos to help out our poor base speed. And from there, we're heading straight over to Silphco a little bit early, but it's worth noting that just like a lot of things in this 
this early to mid game. Rival number five is easier in Pokemon Yellow than it is in Pokemon Red and Blue. So that's kind of why I'm coming here. And I'll explain that a little bit more as we get to it. And you might be surprised here that we're not going to pick up any more optional battles for the remainder of the game. We're only going to do what's mandatory. And we just talked about minimize, but it is what allows this to be possible. Now I do the bare minimum here. I do go out of my way just a little bit to pick up the protein on the fifth floor here. And I guess that means it's time for rival number five. First up is Sand Slash, and it does not have a ground move just yet, so we're at least decently safe, or so you would think. The idea here is to set up three minimizes, and then just kind of start going for body slams. And it does have access to Swift, so it means that our evasion doesn't really matter, but at a certain point in the fight, I guess the AI decides that, hey, I'm just going to hit a critical hit slash, and we start to get a little bit low, so much so that I'm starting to think that, hey, maybe I should use Mega Drain just a little bit to get a little bit of health back to stand a chance here, and I fall for this trap a lot. I always think I can do that and it ends up kind of hurting me more than it helps me and eventually we take it out we get to see the cloister. Here I fat finger a body slam but luck is on my side and it paralyzes the cloister and it skips some turns to boot and since we just leveled up I do set up my remaining three minimizes now we're at plus six evasion and we get a few little extra badge boost for our attack and at this point I am feeling pretty confident. I feel like if I want to win this battle and avoid a reset I need to use some mega drain and I'm able to recover a decent amount of health and eventually I take it out we move on to the Magneton. Even though it hits its moves we're a little bit boosted right now we can two shot it with body slam. I crit just for good measure. I do take a little bit of damage and now we get to see our first kind of real psychic type but it's going to be a common theme. We're set up with minimize it can't really hit us and I take it out. Now at level 37 I get the opportunity to learn sludge. We'll come back to that in a second. I really wanted to make sludge work and I did try it out several times. We'll talk about why it didn't pan out and why I don't learn it here. But as for the end of the fight, this one looks like a done deal. It should be about two body slams to take it out, but it does barely survive. And to my shock and awe, it crits with the bite. It takes us all the way down to 2 HP, but we're still ticking. We might have a couple of bandages on our sprite to the left here, but I am able to take it out on the next turn. But this one, it got really close, but Muck was able to pull it out at the end of the day. And I always tell myself I'm going to put this in video sometimes I do sometimes I don't if you get low on rival number five it's just so helpful to just backtrack just a little bit pick up that hyper potion and use it as a pretty much a full heal at this stage in the game I love that hyper potion and its placement smart move by the game devs now I kind of got a couple of things I want to talk about real quick but first let's go back to sludge while it's fresh on my mind it is the strongest poison move in generation one and given that it has stab 97 effective power is pretty good and I really wanted to utilize it and I was replacing body slam at this stage in the game and it's okay but at the end of the day it really only helps for one fight and it hurts for multiple other fights now you could just see like a little mini part right here where it hurts Jesse and James isn't too interesting especially when you have body slam but when you have sludge you have to set up like about four or five minimizes to make sludge do all right damage you can use Thunderbolt but our special is not very good so it still takes quite a long time and that's just like a little minor fight where sludge makes it take a lot longer than it should be and like I said I really wanted this move to work because you just don't see it in a playthrough too often it's not a signature move it's not a unique move but I really did want to just have it on the final learn set because it feels like something you would want but considering what Muck's weaknesses are and what the toughest battles are having that in place of body slam just didn't make any sense so I did have to cut it and we'll also see on Giovanni number two we'll uh, show that in the background but it really hurts you right there too especially on the Nidal Queen it takes new neutral damage from Mega Drain, so 40 base power with our special doesn't do good. It's immune to Thunderbolt, and it double resists Sludge, so I think even with max minimized setup, it would still take 7 or 8 turns to take it out. It wasn't very good, and I knew I had to make a change for the optimized run, so we'll see that kind of play out in the background. But real quick, I would just like to bring up rival number 5. I said it was easy, and I know there's one person out there saying, it's not easy, yellow's hard, but I got one little factoid to throw at you, brother. And for me, the fact 
that this rival number five in yellow doesn't have an Alakazam yet is pretty much all you need to know. I think it was a smart move to make it weaker. I agree with the changes of yellow. I agree that the early game in red was a little bit overtuned, and I agree that the late game was a little bit undertuned, so I do like the changes in yellow. I'm just simply pointing out what's easier, what's harder. And I think that's all I really need to say about it for now because this is going to get to the start of the game where some things are a lot higher level, but mainly things are just going to have much better learn sets. So let's just move on and see how it plays out. Next up, we got Uncle Koga, which has a much higher level team. And the idea here is to set up minimizes and go to town. Now, this was the one part of the game. This is the one battle where Sludge helps out a good bit. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to set up about six minimizes anyway. And Body Slam was only very marginally worse than Sludge in this situation. And you're going to see on the first attempt, this is kind of what makes minimize so frustrating. Sometimes it works like a charm. Other times it doesn't matter. It's like you're lowering your evasion or something like that because I get hit with sidekick like eight times here and it knocks me out for my second reset and it just didn't matter that I was setting up evasion. This thing just didn't miss and sometimes whether you like it or not, maybe I'm just got a full hat on my head right now. The AI just cheats. It decides it's going to hit you. It doesn't matter what you do. You could have 15 double team set up and the AI is still going to crit you through it. A little bit frustrating, but that's kind of the nature of using minimize. For me personally, what makes it even more frustrating is when you look at the second attempt, I don't get hit a single time. I'm able to set up all six minimizes while staying pretty much at full health. And once you get the boost, Body Slam can one shot all the Venom Nats and we outspeed them. And the only reason I went for plus six on my minimize for this fight is because it puts the Venom Moth at a guaranteed two shot range. The benefit that it can't hit you is just pretty nice as well. But this was not too bad. One reset, you kind of expect it every once in a while with a minimize strategy. But I think it's pretty good to talk about. It's kind of interesting. There's always this dichotomy of when you use it. Sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes it makes all the difference in the world. It's just a little interesting. Next up, I pick up Mimic and then we're heading straight over to Sabrina. And you might be thinking, hey, you're a poison type. Why would you go over to the Psychic Gym? And that's because I do think Sabrina overall is a little bit easier. Her Abra can be a menace with Flash, but here it's pretty much a coin toss. Even if I get hit with the Flash and my accuracy gets lowered, I'm still going to play it out because I think I can win. All you got to do is set up a few minimizes and once they can't hit you, your body slams are hitting harder. It becomes a fairly easy fight. This one was consistent. I even had a fight in practice where I got hit with like three flashes somehow, even though I was setting up minimize and I was still able to outpace and body slam through the Alakazam. And this one, not really as bad as you would actually think it would be. So far, I have yet to do like a Sabrina gym leader intro, and I guess that doesn't really change today, but I really hate to hype up fights that don't live up to it. You know what I'm saying? Now there's not much left to do. I think we can take our weekly very brisk swim down to Cinnabar. There's no optional trainers. It's like pretty much going on a vacation down here. And after answering the age old question of if Tombstoner, brother, is actually the 28th team or not, I think we can finally take a look at Blaine. Oh guys, Blaine has an intro this week. I think you know what that means. But in all seriousness, Blaine has one of the most improved teams from red and blue to yellow. I think you probably know who has the most improved team, but here, things can be a little bit tricky. My experience is set up in such a way where I will level up after the nine tails, so you don't want to overdo it. You want to get some badge boost for your attack going into the later parts of the fight. And nine tails, it could be a little bit of an issue. Here, it's not too bad. Now, when we make it to the Rapidash, we need to finish setting up. And despite my evasion being up several stages, it does hit a couple of moves, including the very inaccurate fire spin, but I'm not going to ask any questions. At the end of the day, we are set up and it's looking like we're kind of primed to sweep the rest of this fight and get out of here with another easy badge, but not so fast. Arcanine, it has other plans. It sets up a reflect to half my damage to buy it a little bit more time, and at the end of the day, it just doesn't care that I have plus six on my evasion. It hits me with a flamethrower anyway, it knocks me out, and that's the third third reset of the run. On the second attempt, I played a little bit differently. I was doing a 3-3 split on my minimizes before I leveled up, and here I just set up two, and thankfully Ninetales doesn't do a whole lot to us, and then we move on, we level up. Now here, I want to set up four times on the rapid dash, and that's gonna make me hit just a little bit harder, and I think that might do the trick here. On the rapid dash, things are going kind of smooth, but wouldn't you know it, through all the evasion boost, it gets off a growl, and growl is the worst thing you can see 
see if you're relying on physical moves like we are for this fight. It's not great. It's a little bit worrisome if I'm being honest with you. Now when we go into the Arcanine, we're just hoping that our plus six evasion can kind of carry us through this fight. But now we're not doing nearly as much damage as we could be doing since we have a Growl debuff on us. This means I call an audible to start going straight Thunderbolts. And let me tell you something, guys. It is doing absolutely pathetic damage. But I do paralyze it and I do get a crit. And it's not looking too bad. I get it down in the red health. But all of a sudden, Blaine decides, hey, I got Fire Blast. I don't care if this dude has plus seven evasion. I'm going to hit this 85% accurate move through all of it. And it hits us. It hits us hard. We go all the way down to eight HP. But the main thing that matters is that we survive. I finish it off the next turn. And this one's a tough battle. I'm telling you guys, Blaine and Yellow version is not really a joke. Now, my friends, when I said Blaine was one of the most improved trainers from red and blue to yellow, I think you all knew who I meant when I said he was at number one. That's going to belong to Giovanni. He's an actual ground top trainer now. And until now, we have not seen many ground moves in this run and we haven't had to worry about them. But now things are going to get a little bit more difficult. A lot of times when you're kind of weighing your options and you're saying, hey, which version of the game should I do? I'm going to have an easier early game if I do yellow, but I'm going to have to face yellow version Giovanni. It's not going to be great, but that's enough talking. I think we should just take a look at uh, Giovanni and see how we do. The main thing that gives me fits about Giovanni is that he leads with the Doug Trio. It's incredibly fast. The battle does start off with a guard spec by Silfco, and that's great. I'm trying to set up plus three evasion here before I take it out, but I do take a super effective dig, and it does incredibly heavy damage over 100 points of health to us. That's not too great, but we do have plus three on our evasion. We have a little bit of minimize set up. Let's see how we can make this work. And the main thing here is that I'm going to level up after the Persian, so I just go straight body slam I take it out fairly quick we level up to 44 and now the tough part of the battle begins because I need to set up three more minimizes but I have to do it against a Pokemon that has earthquake and before I even have a glimmer of hope first turn before I can even make a move I get hit with an earthquake and that's another reset and overall I reset four more times here I'll show you the deaths of all of them in the background and there's probably an obvious solution to this that I really didn't want to do at the time I really don't know I could have just used my rare candies because this is probably the toughest fight in the game and it makes sense to be at your strongest when going into it but I just knew looking at the numbers that this one wouldn't be too bad and eventually I'd be able to overcome it but being up to like level 50 potentially outspeeding the Doug trio or maybe even having it in a position where a body slam could just one shot it with no setup would probably help out quite a bit but I do stand by my routing I stand behind my optimized runs and I do think that this allowed us us to get the fastest time albeit with a few extra resets and I can live with that at the end of the day now let's take a look at the final encounter that finally got us through and we'll talk about it for a minute like I previously mentioned three minimizes on the Doug trio is what you want to do that's what we get here and we don't take any damage in return which is beautiful and we can move straight to the Persian which really isn't a threat on its own it can be a little bit annoying with double teams but here we get the blessed guard spec by Silfco and we take it out in two bodies slams and now let's take a look at what matters on the Nidoqueen. queen i need to finish setting up minimize turn one i get hit with an earthquake i go all the way down to 27 health and this one it's looking pretty dire but i stick with the plan i keep the ship on course i set up three more minimizes it keeps missing and i'm just kind of got my fingers crossed at this point hoping that i can make it through the rest of this battle but it's a little bit worrisome considering that it takes three body slams to take it out Nidoqueen king isn't as tanky as Nidoqueen. queen but nonetheless it still takes three body slams so I'm still sitting here clenched hoping I don't get hit with an earthquake as I slowly chip it down and eventually we're able to make it to the ride on we're really low but my friends this is where mega drain comes in the most clutch it ever could but surprisingly it's not a one shot usually you know this thing being double weak to grass you figure it would be but since we don't have great special it's a two shot and I don't care how much health I'm pretty sure this ride on would just one shot us with 
the earthquake regardless. But thankfully the plus six evasion from Minimize holds true. We take it out and finally the nightmare is over. And I guess for some final thoughts on this battle, there's always this kind of ebb and flow between the fastest time and consistency. And normally I do like consistency. And I do think perhaps rare candies might have been a good thing to use here. But I just don't think it was that bad. As a matter of fact, I think I got a little bit unlucky. We've already talked about the nature of Minimize, how it's going to have its ups and downs. Overall, I don't think it was that bad. Eight resets, I can I can live with that at the end of the day. I guess if you want to continue this discussion, you can down in the comments, but I kind of stick by with how this went. And let's just take a look at Ravel number six real quick. The main thing here to note is that his Sand Slash still does not have a ground move, so we don't really have to worry about that too much just yet. And our goal here, our break point for this fight is four minimizes. Those four badge boosts will really come in clutch for this fight and you'll see why. The first thing is that it puts this Sand Slash into a two shot range with Mega Drain. It's not really that important, but when you're kind of adding up the turns and seeing what can get you the shortest fight overall, this is what number I landed on. The second thing that this does is it puts Execute in a two shot range. Now you are set up with Evasion, so it's unlikely that it will hit you, but we've seen that they do hit you quite a bit. So you don't wanna get put to sleep or have some sort of status move put on you. So just make this as easy as possible. As for Cloyster, a side effect of setting that much to make other things consistent is that it's now a one shot with Thunderbolt. Not much more to say about it than that. When it goes down, we do level up, meaning we lose our badge boost itself. But I do have two more minimizes that I can set up and I go ahead and set them up here. I don't take any damage in return and I'm just hoping that the plus two boost is enough to really make the rest of the fight consistent because when we look at Kadabra, you can see that it's actually a speed tie and if it somehow managed to sneak through a move, it would hurt a lot. But, but also keep in mind, notice this guys, he still doesn't have an Alakazam yet. So if you're keeping tally here, that's another point for all red and blue. I win the speed tie, take it out, and all that's left is the Flareon. We're a little bit boosted, but the main thing is the plus evasion. It really can't do anything to us, and that's the fight over. Not really much more to say about this one. And now we can start kind of thinking ahead to the Elite Four. And before we go in, the first thing I should mention is that I do go ahead and use eight of my 11 rare candies right here. And that's because you will get wild encounters at our current level inside of Victory Road. And I think last time I did this, I got about four or five encounters. And that kind of adds up to a lot of time. So I didn't want to do that. It's just smart to go ahead and use them here. When I think about my overall weaknesses in the Elite Four, Agatha springs to mind. Maybe if you get unlucky on the Gyarados for Lance, that could be bad. But outside of that, I think Muck is kind of primed to have a pretty good run. There's not really much more to talk about other than maybe mention that I get the rare candy inside of Victory Road. And let's just kind of dive into it. Now this isn't exactly Pokemon Red and Blue's Elite Four. Dugong's Lorelei has very special AI, and while it will go for rest most of the time, it doesn't always go for rest. It's a little bit complicated. There are videos on it if you wanna look that up. But anyway, the goal here is plus six minimize, mainly for the special badge boost that we're gonna be getting. And even though I can't one shot the Dugong consistently, it's a pretty good chance I get unlucky twice here, but ultimately we take it down. With all these boosts, that means that close Oyster is a one shot as well as the slow bro. Now Jinx is a one shot but only with body slam so we take it out and at the end of the day all we're left with is the Lapras. And at this point we're so healthy it doesn't matter if it hit us or not but this is the main reason for the plus six minimize. It puts Lapras in a very comfortable two shot range and that's kind of what you want. Overall Lorelai's a pretty easy fight. I, I'm not going to say 100% consistent but it's pretty close. Speaking of 100% consistent, we have Bruno. And while this isn't the main reason I still have Mega Drain, I guess it is kind of one of them. It makes the Onyxes really easy to take out. I guess you could kind of slog through the first one, mimic an Ice Punch from the Hitmonchan, and that would make the second one a one shot. But overall, you just don't need it. You don't even have to set up Minimize. It's Bruno, not much to say. Let's not make the video any longer than we have to. After the battle, I do replace Mega Drain with Mimic, and now I guess we can take a look at Agatha. For me personally, I feel like Agatha's a downgrade in Pokemon Yellow, mainly because her first Gengar doesn't have Hypnosis, and for me, I feel like that's the biggest threat. If the first Gengar puts you to sleep, it can just kind of have its way with you, and that's what makes the fight so luck-based and a roll of the dice. But here, we pretty much have one goal. We want to set up 
plus six minimize. And although we don't have a great answer for ghost, we can mimic Lick from the Gengar. Now Lick is a pretty awful move, but it's pretty much the only thing we got to work with. And you can see it takes quite a while to kind of wrangle this one under control, get our full setup, take Mimic, get rid of the substitute. It takes quite a while. And even with the plus six setup, pretty much everything, the three ghost types are all gonna be two shot with Lick. It's kind of just a testament just to how weak this move actually is. I guess it is worth noting that the final Gengar does know Psychic. It can do some pretty nice super effective damage, but at that point it's too little too late, I'm too healthy, and Agatha just really can't do much to me. I don't love using Lick from Mimic, but sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do, and it did make this one fairly consistent. Next up is Lance, and Minimize is getting all the spotlight once again. The magical number for this fight is four, and that's for multiple different reasons. Now you only need a couple to be able to one-shot the Gyarados, and I guess it kind of says something about a Pokemon when you need multiple boost just to one-shot it with a double super effective move but it is what it is. We set up four times, we take it out. And as for the first Dragonair, it doesn't have anything that we want. We take it out with a couple of body slams. We can keep moving on. And the thing I love about yellow version Lance is his second Dragonair has Ice Beam. Any Pokemon pretty much in the entire game can just mimic Ice Beam and at least have a shot at beating Lance. Now the reason, one of the main reasons here that we set up four minimizes at the start was so that we can outspeed the Aerodactyl so that we can avoid maybe getting crazy or some other shenanigan that can maybe cause a reset. And the second thing is that it puts the final Dragonite into a guaranteed one-shot range, and that's what you want to see. So overall, it makes this one very consistent. I've said that word a lot, but I really like my Elite Fours to be pretty consistent, and I feel like we've kind of accomplished that goal so far. But there is one more battle left. Two things are worth noting here. I did use my final three rare candies to get up to level 61. And the second thing is that Sandslash finally has a ground move in Earthquake. Obviously, you don't want to get hit with that. And we don't really get hit with it here. I'm able to set up four minimizes. And I used Mimic. I'm going to be taking Earthquake for this fight. And in my head, yeah, I have this intuition, I guess. I was like, as soon as I use this, I know I'm going to get hit with Earthquake. And wouldn't you know it, I get hit. But thankfully, it was after we've already set up. And with all the bad boost to our defense. I really don't take too much damage. I'm not too worried about it. At that point, plus four makes it a comfortable two-shot earthquake range on the sand slash. We don't get hit anymore and we can move on. From there, we've already hit our magical number. Plus four is all we need. We outspeed the Alakazam. It's a one-shot. Now the main reason we needed plus four on this fight is that it puts the executor in a 100% two-shot range with body slam and I definitely don't want to get put to sleep and just kind of draw this fight out any longer than it needs to be. And and for the next two Pokemon, the Magneton and the Cloyster, we have Earthquake, we have Thunderbolt, we're set up, so it's pretty much a done deal. I would just like to say that I love the Minimize Sprite. I like that it turns you into just a little guy. Look at you. You're just a little guy when you use Minimize when you have animations on, and I always found it really funny. Now, as for the Flareon, we do level up going into this fight, and the Medium Fast Leveling Group, it's pretty much impossible to avoid leveling up at some point during this fight, so I picked it here. I get off an Earthquake, but it's not enough to one shot it but all it does on its turn is set up a reflect and I'm sorry bud but it's a little bit too late for a reflect and we take it out and we take the battle and that's it. Muck has done it. With a final time of 3 hours, 1 minute and 31 seconds, and 8 total resets, I gotta say it was a pretty solid run. If you just want to know for comparison's sake, my very first run was like in the 4 hour range, then my second run after I optimized a little bit was about 3.30, and then we finally got it down to 3.01. I do think, just like pretty much all runs, I only do 3 runs per Pokemon at max, just so I can keep a constant video schedule flowing out. I do think you could save a little bit of time here. I actually think you might be able to rework some parts of this to make it a little faster, but I don't think it would be much faster. And for me, that's the point to where I say I'm happy with this run because at the end of the day, I really don't care about saving two or three minutes. But I do think it was an interesting run. I think Minimize really carries this run. I actually think this run could be really good. Maybe like top 15 if it just started out with maybe a better move or even if it just got Mega Punch in Mount Moon. That's pretty much my thoughts on it. I think it's a pretty solid Pokemon. And today, my friends, I have a little bit of a surprise for you. I'm reworking the tier list. I didn't know exactly how I wanted to do it. So I think for now, the safest
safest thing is I'm gonna put them on cards. This is the base template for a card. And now you can see here, if we made muck onto the card, it would look like this. You can see it's game time, you can see it's resets. And now we can take a look, we can just roll out this beautiful little pseudo tier list here where we got everything kind of ranked by the numbers. And if we stop on this second page here, I think right before Cliff Fairy would make the most sense. Although Rydon does have a ton of resets, I don't think I can ignore like a 11, 12 minute increase. So that fits for now. Now there might be some recent streams that aren't on here. I notoriously take a long time to get my streams put on the tier list. But tell me what you think of these cards. Now we're gonna start seeing it. I wanted to roll this out and be done with it. Especially when we're looking at the summer for those cross-gen runs. I wanted to have something special and I think this looks pretty good. I can't wait for you guys to see the other things. And when we finally kind of get caught up on streams and stuff, I'm thinking about releasing a video. I think it's cool looking. Definitely give me some feedback on that. But I think that's about all I have for you guys today. Once again, special shout out to my channel members. I appreciate every single one of you that gives me any sort of support at all. It does mean a lot. And like I always say, if you're listening to my voice right now, you're a real one. I really appreciate you. Uh, if you just want to engage with me even more, type real one down in the comment just so I know you made it this far. Now this one was really fun. For some reason, I really struggled doing this one scriptless. I felt like I had to do it in like four or five different parts. Sometimes I can just sit down and do this thing in one part, but I don't know. I really struggled with this one. I had fun. I've been wanting to do Muck for a while. Muck's definitely one I want to do for the Alolan Summer type events, so I wanted to get it out. But I'm really excited about that. Uh, we're pretty close to getting to there, but I guess I'll catch you guys on the next video. Bye!